you know, it basically, I, I went out and left in the morning. I was like, I, I can't do this anymore with a good conscience. I mean, I can't say just diversify and you're going to be okay. Because I was doing financial planning. So we have to put in running around like chickens with their heads cut off, wondering where do I place my capital if the capital even is still there? Yeah, good. that's a great question right there um, and a good one to end on. So I, I think... My name is Luke and I'm here with my new acquaintance uh, slash hopefully friend, Aaron. Aaron Johnson, thank you for joining me. I appreciate, for, appreciate your time for having this conversation. Thanks, Luke. Good to be here. Yeah. So um, I know very little about you. I know that you are a financial advisor, correct? I don't know where you're based. I don't know if you want to say was, or not. But... Was a financial advisor. You you were. You were a financial yes. advisor. Okay. I've come great. to my senses. You've come <clears throat> to your senses. Wow. Okay. We're, we're, <laughs> we're already getting controversial. Um, yeah. Even ahead. Yeah. Um, so before we talk about anything else, I'd like to learn more about you. What's your background? You used to be a financial advisor. What do you do now? What 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 do you mean come to your senses? Yeah. And, you know, just just give us give us a little bit of the story. Sure. So um, I am still a financial consultant of sorts. Um, I help people with, uh, you know, their wealth management, financial planning, uh, investment management. But I say I've come to my senses because um, I'm no longer an SEC registered advisor. advisor. You know what that is, right? Yeah, yeah. Um... Yeah, could you uh, touch on it a little bit more for those that don't, but I'm sure. basically aware of it. So basically, in this country, if you give financial advice and you're paid for it, uh, you have to register with the SEC mm -hmm. um, or with the state. So um, when people ask me if I'm a financial advisor, you know, I can say, well, I, I do a lot of the same things that I did before, but there is an important distinction to be made. And I think at least in the, uh, you know, as far as the public is concerned, um, they need to understand that distinctions, even, even though it seems kind of technical, um, it really does matter because I think there's this tendency uh, among people, uh, human behavior, not just, you know, clients, um, to, to outsource something like, say, your you know, wealth management and think that's good. So-and-so handles that for me. And so, and that's really what the advisory world does, I think, is it allows, especially the older generation, Luke, you know, not so much younger generations like yours, um, where you guys want to do it, you know, virtually yourself through something like a personal capital. Um, but certainly my parents and uh, my grandparents, you know, they, that was kind of the model. And so I, I really believe, and then I, I came to my senses, the last two years really has been quite a, uh, an awakening for me because I realized the limitations in that um, and, and how much people don't really um, manage their own wealth. Now that doesn't mean they need to become experts. Um, I do believe that there are uh, activities like say getting your tax return done or, um, there are things that you need help with, but um, I think that, uh, you know, people should be as involved in the process as they can be. So anyway, so I, I, uh, I, I guess I split that hair because I want to be sure that when a person comes to me, you know, I'll tell them, hey, this is here, here are the facts. Here are the different paths you can take. Um, but whatever you do is your decision. Um, you need to own it. And so if you're going to own it, you need to understand it. For example, Bitcoin, you and I are both Bitcoiners and we're proud of that fact. Um, I try to orange people, every ch orange pill people, every chance I get these days. Um, but at the same time, like, you know, I say the last thing I usually say is, but it's volatile. You know, if you're going to measure Bitcoin's value in dollar terms, expect to have a wild ride. And so um, it's your choice. You know, what you do today, if you go out and get Bitcoin, that's going to be your choice. Own it. And I don't want to hear, I don't want you to come back to me and say, you know, hey, you said, and it didn't work out. And I think the old model um, that I was in for 25 years, I mean, I was 
an independent wealth manager from 1996 when I started, um, you know, when I was 20 years old uh, until two years ago. Um, and interestingly, and we can get into all this, but I don't want to go on too long, that kind of coincided with my uh, Bitcoin awakening. I had to kind of get out of what I call fiat financial services uh, to begin to learn about money. That's the irony here is I, I started learning about uh, money and how it all works only after um, you know that happened for me. So I think that's very interesting. I, I didn't know that going into this that you weren't. Oh, really? That, that you weren't. <laughs> I, I didn't realize that you were an ex financial advisor. That makes this make this even more interesting. Uh, yeah. I, I think what you touched on, though, it, Bitcoin aside, finance aside, I think what you touched on essentially is coming down to people outsourcing critical thought, and I think with the beginning of the information age, which we're in, I think so many people have such an abundance of information and constant stimulus that I think, frankly, it's hijacking our brains. And we have this natural tendency to outsource critical thought to other people yeah, to like dampen exactly. the noise because we're just bombarded yeah. with constant notifications and constant news. And I mm -hmm. think our brains more and more so are just defaulting to relying on other people to think for us. And I think... Mm -hmm. Obviously, there are many topics we can go into, which we probably shouldn't. You know, there's the political discussion. There's the <laughs> disease slash vaccine discussion. There's the finance mm. slash Bitcoin discussion. You know, there's like half a dozen different rabbit holes you can go down over the last five years. But I think mm -hmm. fundamentally, it all come down to the same problem, that there are some people that are more, um, whether genetics, personality, background, whatever, for whatever reason, um, tend to prefer outsourcing critical thought to experts. So like in this case, financial advisors or consultants. And then there are other people that are more resistant to that independent or perhaps lower on agreeableness. Mm -hmm. And that's that's not necessarily saying one or the other is right. The experts oftentimes are right. And the experts oftentimes are wrong because they bias is just like the rest of us. So anyway, just, just, just to expand on that, I, I think you're right. And I, and I hope that really hits a core with people that so much of what we have today, I think is in this abundance of information just a lack of critical thought and so it seems like to mm -hmm. you that you and your view had this awakening and you decided to um step out of that entirely which is um very fascinating and, and i think coming yeah. making, making full circle back to finance i think of 2008 because essentially and you could probably speak into this with more detail than i will but <clears throat> with 2008 it seems like that was a basic problem that everyone had outsourced their critical thinking and everyone outsourced yeah. the risk again and again and again you know all these brokers and these lenders wanted to outsource their bad mortgages and then of course everyone wants to repackage it as cdos and you know all, all these um securities out there and people just kept rehypothecating and pushing it off to the next person thinking mm -hmm. that it either didn't apply to them or that even if it did apply to them, they have the insurance. And then of course, once the whole thing started unwinding, it's you had the problem with the mortgages and then you had AIG mm -hmm. that was insuring those mortgages. And so, you know, to me, I find it extreme. I've talked about this in the shows too, but I find it extremely fascinating when people or extremely frustrating when people want to blame one group of people for 2008. And I don't know if you um, would agree with me here, but basically the way I would put it is that basically everyone was responsible for 2008 from mm -hmm. Wall Street and the Fed all the way down to, you know, the, the rating agencies and every single, you know, we all are responsible because we were yeah. mass psychosis or this mass hypnosis. Mm -hmm. we all were offsourcing and pretending that none of this matters when in reality it does. And so yeah. with that said, that's my personal view. Maybe you disagree, but with that said, no, I agree. where do you think we are today? Where do you think people are outsourcing their critical thought where you think that that's okay when it comes to bitcoin or finance and banking and everything that's going on right now yeah uh, and where do you think the dangers lie well i think that um people don't understand luke that fiat money is poisoning everything um i didn't understand that i didn't even really begin to go down the rabbit hole until again two years ago it was actually january 6th 2021 and it was a total coincidence. I had had a, you know, a basically I, I went out and left in the morning. I was like, I, I can't do this anymore. 
with a good conscience. I mean, I can't say just diversify and you're going to be okay because I was doing financial planning. So we have to put in, you know, inflation assumptions. We have to, we're trying to forecast for the future and to make people feel reasonably confident that what they're doing is going to work out the way that I'm saying it's going to work out for them. And I mean, I began to feel like, I don't think so. Um, and so I, I couldn't really continue. I had left in the morning and I came back and my son, whose name is Luke, by the way, um, he said, dad, did you see what happened to the Capitol? So that kind of, uh, that's why I won't forget it because it was such a, you know, a landmark day. But, um, but I really, I, I, at that point, I talked to my wife, we went out the rest of the day. And even though my practice was doing better than it's ever done before, I was, I was probably in my prime. I'm in my late forties. I got an early start. So I had all these years ahead of me where I could have done really well in wealth management. And I, I was on, on my game. I've got my designations. I mean, it was, it was prime, you know, and but we just, we felt like we couldn't, I felt like I couldn't continue to do it. And so I kind of got permission for my wife to do something else. We weren't sure what that was going to be, but, you know, I really began probably like so many who have gone down the Bitcoin rabbit hole. It didn't start off that way. I, I was looking at Polkadot and Dogecoin. I was like, ah, maybe these things will make me money. Um, you know, like most people. And, and I started reading people like Robert Breedlove and gg and i'm like these guys are speaking something that's stirring something up inside of me and so i and i mean i've at this point i would say luke that i've spent at least uh a thousand hours you know just reading about bitcoin uh because i can't get enough of it right i'm sure you can relate yeah, uh, yeah likewise so. i i i often when i say that to people um, you know, they say that, oh, it must be an obsession or it must be, you know, you're, tr you're, you're trying to confirm your own biases or whatever. And I don't know yeah. about for you, but for me, when I started like reading and like, just keep like soaking into it, it was because I had all these questions or concerns and I was like, okay, okay. How do I kill this thing? What, what's wrong with it? Why is it a Ponzi? But then when I couldn't find the answer and actually it was the complete opposite. And my, what I thought was a point of concern mm -hmm. was actually a strength. Then it was like, okay, wait, and for me, yeah. I, I also feel like I, I, I think I've spent at least a thousand hours or the last few years of me easily. Yeah. And uh, for, for me, it was from a point of like trying to figure out how on earth do I kill this thing? How do I stop this thing? And <laughs> I, I just continue. I can't, I can't more and more. And then yeah. I find other people like you or breed love or other people you mentioned. And it's just like, you know, they're smart and it seems that they've come to a similar conclusion. It's like, Oh my goodness, what what is this thing? And so yeah. and anyway, it, it's it's very funny how um when I was I was going down the rabbit hole with other subjects, you know, they the interest kind of fizzles out or whatever, but with Bitcoin, it just keeps going because I can't I can't figure out a way to kill it, which makes it You're right. fascinating. So anyway, I don't know. I, I, hear I don't you. know if you felt the same way, but yeah. Yeah. I thought um, you know, the more you get to understand it, it it's kind of like because we're both Christians and you know, I, I set out to you know, to show these Christians, you know, how they're wrong, um, even though I was raised in a Christian household. Um, but the more I examined it, the more I examined it, because it just kept surprising me. And that uh, that's, you know, that's not a, you know, that, that's uh, not unusual. So yeah, I, I feel the, the same way. But I think to answer your prior question, I began to see just how much fiat money has, has really poisoned the whole thing. I don't think we have a, you know, a banking a problem so much even though we do uh, we have a problem that's deeper than that and that's the very money that we use uh globally i mean it's it's basically fiat or nothing uh, or at least it has been right until until pretty recently with bitcoin so um so that that's what i think you know kind of getting back to people outsourcing critical thought which i like that expression um is i i really think the world needs to wake up to the fact that we're dealing right from right out of the gate this this thing that we call money we haven't understood it and and we we need to get it fixed and hey guess what there is a fix it's already here it just needs to you know people just need to see that it's here the way that i have said it um is that um bitcoin basically is the key that unlocks the shackles of and of 
basically enslaved humanity, the fiat shackles. And it's there. We're already here. I mean, you and I both know that it's not just that. I mean, obviously, there's um, fallen human nature and there's some even deeper things that go even below that. But if we had yeah. good money, I know that we'd have a much better world than we have right now. So so I think that's where I start with people now. And by the way, just to clarify, I am still doing a lot of what I did before, but now it's all hourly. Everything I do is by the hour now. And so it's my time because that's a resource none of us are getting any more of as far as I know. Um, yeah. And so I just say, hey, I, I'm, I'm not going to advise you. I'm, we're, we're going to sit down, we're going to have a yeah. conversation and I'll, I'll flip the meter and, you know, you can pick my brain and I can kind of tell you what I would do in your position, but whatever you do, you know, whatever critical thought you're going to have to do, it's going to be your own. You're going to have to own it, but I'm here to help. I'm here to hold your hand and hopefully give you some confidence. But, um, so anyway, ho you, hopefully that yeah. answered your question. You know, you, you did answer my question. You already answered another question I had, which was how on earth are you able to talk to me? Because um, I've not talked about this too much yet online or on Twitter at all, but I've gotten so many messages and you're probably not surprised, but I've gotten, I don't know, probably 12 to 15 messages now. Maybe I should count them, but I've gotten a bunch of messages from financial advisors, CPAs and bankers that are, you know, legit, you know, like I can look them up and they're legit. And yeah. they basically said, I'm so glad you're out there talking about this because I think either they say, I think you're right. Or they say, I fully agree with you, but I can't, I can't talk about it. And, you know, exactly. I, I invite them to have this exact conversation with you. And they're like, I can't talk about it. And it's not even uh -huh. because it's like this, you know, dark room with a spooky person saying, no, don't talk about Bitcoin. It's just, it's just yeah. they're legally, they can't, you know, otherwise yeah. their job's at stake or their reputation or, you know, and so it's. That, that was that was point of being that's one of my questions of like how how can i talk to you because you know <laughs> nobody everyone else says they can't talk to me but you say you can't yeah so, so that yeah, i've always been your consultant not an advisor yeah yeah and and i've always been independent i have never worked for someone else yeah. I, I i'm i'm i just i couldn't yeah. do that yeah and thankfully my father is very entrepreneurial so he got things started i'm not the entrepreneur that he is but he got things started and, yeah. and he puts yeah. it he hacked through the jungle and i got to follow yeah. um and so, uh, so I, I've been independent, so I can, I'm probably more free than the guy who works for a large uh, brokerage institution. But at the same time, you're absolutely right. You know, we're fiduciaries often. And so we're held to the highest standard of the law. And so what, what we say is, you know, is going to um, be weighed very carefully. Um, and so you're absolutely right. It's like, if you're, if you go into a brokerage firm, you know, they're, they're probably still, even today, you know, just not going to talk about it, um, even though there are companies like Fidelity, um, which are pretty friendly to it and getting friendlier by the day. So it'll change. But, you know, things happen slowly. So, yeah, well, slowly, then quickly, most probably, at least. I right. Think. Gradually, then suddenly. Exactly. Yeah, yeah. So now that we have a bit more of a background, I'd love to dive more into the controversial stuff. So okay. fl flipping this point back back on its head have you you're in the industry much more than me much longer than i have been do you see financial advisors bankers institutions you know people within your industry of traditional finance and traditional finance advisory roles that are understanding bitcoin and they have a similar kind of moral dilemma that you had where you feel like you can't do the same or do, do you see that at all is it large small is it new no, and I don't. I don't know why. Um, I don't know if you know. It, it's probably a function of many things. Like I said, when I was, you know, in when I came to this realization on the morning of January sixth, um, it was really difficult. I mean, I I'm doing well. I have four children. Um, at the time, my oldest was, you know, probably nineteen, still living in the house, though. You know, so I've got. I've I've got the expenses, you know, and and sometimes they get I, more expensive when they're going to college. Right? Yeah, right. And so, um, so I don't know. I'm 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 not sure. Um, when I have talked to financial advisor friends, um, or like I was actually after that, I I uh, had a lapse, and I I thought, well, maybe go work for a financial advisor, and I did actually for a short time, and um, I mean, it was almost funny to me how. Uh, their responses, you know, to, to Bitcoin was, really? 
you know, and, and there's, they're always so cliche, right? Or at least to you and I, it's like, you do know that there are people who have written, you know, 10,000 word essays on that very thing that you could go out and read and will destroy that, you know, shallow defense or that shallow statement you just made. But I was that guy too. I was the guy who was, well, it's not backed by anything. And, you know, it's not uh, run by the government. They're going to shut it down. All the cliches that, that if you've been in the Bitcoin a rabbit hole for a while, you know, you've heard. But uh, I don't know. That's a good question. Um, probably it's just so scary and new. I mean, I think you and I would agree that um, this is like a once in a, let's say, a millennium. I don't know, maybe even longer than that kind of phenomenon, maybe like the Internet. You know, it's, it's a major uh, development by humanity. And so, you know, the, those kinds of major things, I mean, you know, people like Paul Krugman were saying the Internet was going to go the way of the fax machine in the early days. And so obviously, yeah. you know, the, yeah. that's that's not the case, you know, so so it may just be that we're early and we, we hear that a lot. Yeah. Right. It's we're still early. We're still early. Yeah. And so that it, that may be the only reason it's just we're early on the adoption curve. But but I don't know. It's, it's a good question. It'd be worth yeah. uh, exploring. I, I have a thought on that and I'd love to hear your opinion on it. And my, my, my thought is this, that. As I've been thinking about technology and how if we assume there's more change in the future than the past, you know, because if we have an exponential curve, each iteration doubles and then, you know, the next hundred years theoretically should have more changed than the last. And so in, in thinking about that, I, I've for me, the way I put it to myself is that what if the technologies that fundamentally cause the most change are the ones we expect the least or the ones that are fundamentally the most difficult for our brains to understand you know yeah i was not around in the 90s but if i went back then and i asked people what are the technology of the future i'm sure i'm sure they would have said like flying cars or x <laughs> y and z you know, you know like like the yeah. typical tangible stuff of the future mm. that we yeah. can envision but um you know it, it's things we don't expect at all like the yeah. internet that seem to me to, it, like I, I don't know it, it's it's sort of this irony that human brains like we have this expectation of what the future looks like but then because technology is just operating an entirely different universe in our brains it's like it comes around us and and slices up so well, one of yeah. the funny things is like star trek i don't know if you were watching the old star treks but it's funny how um what, what, what are they the little walkies or whatever like their little you know they're little oh yeah the tricorder or whatever that thing yeah, is called. yeah yeah and it's like that was like a big deal to them and now it's uh -huh. like we have this thing that could not have even been imagined um, then, mm. and it's it's funny how the the phone um, has made more progress in the last you know fifty years or ever since Star Trek came out than mm. you know space travel. You know people view intergalactic space travel or whatever at the same level as a basic you know BlackBerry phone from two thousand four. So anyway, anyway, right. all that's just a um, little thought experiment there. That I think probably part of it is that our brains inherently can't understand it. Another thing that I'm thinking too is that it's not just technology that's difficult for brains, but, and I really want to hear your thoughts on this, but what if the training and the experience and the education that financial advisors and professional investment and portfolio managers receive actually is doing in this specific case more harm than good? Um, it, and my, my reasoning for that, my thought behind that is the metaphor I've given before, perhaps you heard me uh, before give it, but basically if I think this from a technological standpoint, if I was in the year 1800 or 1820 or whatever, and I had been trained, you know, in school, in college, graduate, master's degree even, or whatever, um, and then I go in the professional world, and my whole job and career is training horses, breeding horses, buying, selling horses. And my, my whole mentality, like I have trained my brain to understand how to see value in a good horse uh, better than any of us today can do. But to me, the question is, what if they are trained so well at identifying what makes a good horse that when you show them a locomotive, or when you bring it to them, it like gives zero indicators of being mm -hmm. what is valuable or being a perfect horse uh more or less and so i guess my question yeah. is do you think that's the case here too or do you think the idea is true that perhaps all this education financial advisors have on how to diversify and how to um, manage money is basically 
causing them to understand Bitcoin at an artificially slower rate. Because I would argue that Bitcoin basically is doing exactly what a diversified portfolio is designed to do. And I think these folks are so well trained at diversifying a portfolio, they fail to realize that Bitcoin is like the perfect uh, diversified portfolio or as, as close to perfect as we mm -hmm. have. So anyway, that, that was a long question, yeah. but do you think that that's true? Where, where do you no. think that's accurate? Where do you think that's accurate? I think you're, I think, yeah, I definitely think you're onto something there. Um, like I said, you know, I feel like I had to get out of that is mine after 20 oh. before your, your, your i began to learn you know it's like okay. what were you doing the whole time <laughs> um and so i think you're right i think it's like when when all you've known is horses and the car comes along you're not sure why we need a horseless carriage um you can't understand that one day we're not even going to use horses to get around you know it's 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 so revolutionary that you just you know it's a paradigm shift so and I, right yeah because and maybe this happens luke in any industry like say the medical field in light of what's happened over the last three years right mm -hmm. you know you it's so institutionalized or so stultified that not a lot of room for new ideas for growth or for innovation so true humanity we to try to um, uh, have predictability and when we do that you know we aren't ready for something that hits us completely with blind side mm -hmm. so i think you're right i think it's in in part training is what's preventing us from seeing it yes technology okay. and how we're having so many problems with yeah it. yeah technology yeah we're, we're we're having some technical difficulties but i think we got it working back again uh, the, yes. the great irony in all this um <laughs> the, the funny thing is though probably in five years you know this will all be really different and we'll have new problems yeah. that we can't even envision yet yeah uh, that's right okay. to your point like, exactly yeah, yeah kind of like in the same way that we can't envision the technologies of the future it's like who knew that 15 years ago, our biggest inconveniences would be like, oh, our Zoom connection's not good or whatever. So <laughs> yeah. it's funny. Um, so anyway, so we, I think we've addressed pretty uh, thoroughly the potential downsides in having um, humans uh, be financial advisors. To me, I, I guess the way I would put it is that at the end of the day, financial advisors are humans and they have a set of biases and they have a set of regulations and that's all great until the paradigm um, in which, or, or the base set of rules in which those regulations work is fundamentally changing. And that's one of the ways I just yeah. I describe Bitcoin is that basically, and I would, I would love to hear your thoughts on this. So I'm not just trying to talk here, but, but what, I, what I would put it with Bitcoin, what I've said to people is that basically for all this time, we have had imperfect forms of money. So money that is not immutable, money that can have an increase or decrease in amount of its scarcity, uh, m money that is able to be exploited by humans. But as you said earlier, all humans, that, which we are agreement, are fallible and corruptible, and I would argue are corrupt and, fa and inherently fallible. And so when you have the imperfect money, your, your base set of rules is don't save in the money. Don't save in whatever form of currency that is, which I often call political currency because it's issued mm -hmm. by a political institution, which is just another set of rules. Mm -hmm. And you don't save in that, you save in assets. So, you know, historically that's been gold and real estate mostly, but then now stocks after um, the Dutch uh, market, I mean, stocks last few hundred years, we've had stocks. Uh, that's been a really uh, highly monetized one. And then, you know, you have oil and, and fine art and other things that are much more recent. And now you have this digital collectible commodity thing that we call Bitcoin. And so to me, it's, it seems that we're leaving a worldview that it was, we have imperfect money. And so to compensate that, we have to diversify our risk out away from the money because it's too much risk to hold our money in cash, in, in dollars, whether it's Dutch dollars or American dollars or British dollars. We can't, that's too much risk. So let's diversify your risk outwards into the real economy, so to speak. Right. Yeah. And and so that's what we we pay people like you for is like, okay, tell us where we can, you know, basically the way I would I would think of it is that if I were to hire you or a, a financial advisor, I'm hiring them 
to guide me and how to protect my economic energy and my purchasing power against the inevitable debasement and devaluation of mm. the underlying currency at which I'm pricing that energy within. And mm -hmm. so then the question becomes, what if we were to find a way that is a system that can convert brute force physical cost energy into information, which is money, money is information and energy, basically mm. create something that is a perfect money, theoretically. And then it becomes, instead of energy flowing out of the weaker open system of cash, it's always deflating or, or deflating in value, inflating supply mm. into mm. assets that are more hard and more scarce. Now it seems like, okay, the incentive is back. And so, and so the, the, basically then the conclusion is that Bitcoin, buying Bitcoin is simultaneously the highest concentration and the most diversified thing in the world. Because mm. if you have an extremely high allocation of Bitcoin, you're like, you know, percentage wise, <clears throat> you're extremely high Bitcoin. But as far as allocation goes, you're basically investing in an index fund of like the entire human race and economic productivity and the energy grid, you know? And, and so mm. I, I, that's one of those dynamics that I think is yet to really hit people that yeah. you're buying this one sole thing, you're diversifying better than mm -hmm. anything else. You know, it, yeah. it's diversifying in American bonds and American tech companies and stocks is like, sure, that's great. And that's worked mm. when the money has been bad, but what happens when the money is good and there's no longer an incentive to monetize all these things that maybe shouldn't have been monetized. So that's the exactly. way I would put it. How yeah. do you put it? Because you mentioned diversification earlier, and that really grinds people's gears. They're like, oh, yeah. these Bitcoiners are crazy. They're, they say diversification yeah. is bad. But what, how do you view diversification? Do you agree with what I just said? What twist would you put I on think it? So. I, I think so. I mean, um, maybe I have a different understanding of it, or let's put it this way. I think time will reveal this, but we've never really lived, or at least – people who are alive today have never really lived in a world with good money. Um, and, and I think Bitcoin is, I have, I wrote an article that I've not published, but I, I wrote it for my own benefit. You know, Bitcoin is already the greatest money the world has ever known. And I really believe that even if it doesn't have the adoption that we hope for it's, if you look at what you want in money, you know, as, you know, something that is scarce, something that is divisible, fungible, portable, all those things that we know that money should be, or at least now I do, since I have studied over the last couple of years. Um, for me, I think about like, what am I willing to part with my Bitcoins for? And I tell you what, and it's, it's not a whole lot, but the very few times that I've spent my Bitcoins or invested, let's say, um, you know, it's in something that I really believed in, you know, it didn't, I didn't care so much that in Bitcoin terms, this thing that I spent the Bitcoin on might not be worth as much later on in Bitcoin yeah. terms, because I believed in it. So I think what a sound money does is just, it makes for honest and good investing. You know, if you're going to, let's say that you, you really wanted to buy um, a homestead. Um, out in the country and it had a hundred acres or something, you know, and that was just something that you, that it, it really didn't matter to you what its value was, let's say in either dollars or Bitcoin, because it was, it was so meaningful to you. And you were going to, let's say, you know, start several businesses there. You were going to grow crops and maybe raise animals or something. You know, it was, it, it there was more meaning involved. It wasn't just uh, an economic decision. It was also a meaning decision, a decision for what is meaningful to you. Like that's something, and I, I'm using a real example. That's something I'd love to have, you know, a place. And that's something that I might be willing uh, to part with Bitcoin for, but it's it's going to have to wait. I'm going to wait until Bitcoin, you know, kind of cools off or, or cools down and becomes that more reliable store of value and on the adoption curve. But um, But yeah, I feel like, you know, it's the default. You know, if you if there's nothing compelling out there, in my view, um, you know, in a perfect world, 100 percent Bitcoin, then, um, you know, but and again, for anybody watching this, that is not advice. Um, and we can't really do that um, practically today, obviously, because, you know, our utility bill still has to be paid with dollars, you know, so so we have to use like my own um, 
uh, where, where my wife and I are at today is that we have a bare minimum in dollars. We have a bare minimum in dollars. We have pretty much, you know, gone over into to Bitcoin and our own personal wealth. Um, and as that which is compelling pops up and, and I'm willing to part with Bitcoin for it, then I'll, quote, diversify into those things. I don't know that that really addresses what you're getting at, but that's kind of how I feel about it, that, you know, it's such a it's such a sound money that you, know, you have to have some pretty, in my view, you have to have some pretty uh, compelling investment opportunities, um, certainly right now, maybe later on when Bitcoin is, let's say, when it's $10 million, you know, if we're thinking in dollar terms. And we, we always do that, don't we, even though, yeah. you know, we're going to have to <laughs> that, unlearn that. That's... that. Yeah, that's the irony that people call me a mega bull or moon boy or whatever because I am like Bitcoin's going to 5 million, 10 million, 100 million, whatever. <laughs> but it's like the, the great irony in that is that it's like, it's still nonsensical. It's it's still, yeah. It, it, it's, it's like, it, it's it's so ridiculous. Um, yeah, it's but, really more about purchasing power, right? It's yeah, so, you know, yeah. like, you know, today one Bitcoin buys you roughly what, say, $28,000 yeah. buys you out there in yeah. the marketplace. But, so it's not we're not saying that it's going to be 10 million so much as we're saying it's like you're going to have that kind of purchasing power someday. Yeah. So, again, I'm not sure I addressed your question, but I do no, feel no, like I, it's I, going I, to change I, the investing world dramatically. I, I think I, I fully agree. And I think a part of that is because of how we emotionally approach money. I think the complete opposite of what you just said is exactly what's happening like, you know, over the last few weeks in March of 2023 with Silicon Valley Bank. With the FDIC, with the Treasury, and but like what is basically happening is they're doing the complete opposite of what you just said, and that the money is so cheap and so guaranteed and so easy that it's like, oh sure, you can buy as many bonds as you want, mm -hmm. and we'll just guarantee everything, uh, all the deposits, everything. We'll, we'll make yeah. everyone say, and and it, it's again back to human nature. Human nature is like, oh that's good, you know, we we want to protect depositors, or whatever, but nobody considers that what if we're actually not solving the problem? What if we're just changing the problem? Like, oh, we won't let these investors lose the money from the risk they took. Mm -hmm. We'll just take that risk that was in these bonds and we'll just move it over into the underlying currency and therefore destabilize everything. Yeah, it's yeah. the same thing with 2008. It's like, mm -hmm. let's take, okay, the risk in the, these mortgages was too high and the thumb holdings collapsing. What if we propped it up and instead we move all this risk over to the currency, which then you're basically taking risk and like, it's like instead of having a, a bottle of water or poison, it's like, oh, well, let's just put it in the whole city. It, and it's much more dilute. And so none of us realize it, but you keep doing that enough. And anyway, I'm going to rant now, but it's, yeah. it's point being that in the same way that you just said that Bitcoin could, and I would argue is uh, forcing people to be much more conscientious in what they're buying and what they're putting money in. Because I, I mm. think if people operate in a bitcoin standard they'd be much more cautious in putting money into a stock or into the stock oh market. yeah <laughs> because now you ask those questions but right now none of us ask those questions yeah smash buy bonds smash buy stocks dollar cost <laughs> average every week yeah. and we you know we, we you know have these little retirement models and all that and mm -hmm. it, it's worked but what if um the underlying assumption the whole underlying assumption in that thesis is that the money is bad, and so we must save in the stocks and bonds. We must save in the debt of our government, which we all know is insolvent, and we mm. must save in the equities of of these companies, which we know valuations yeah. are forced too high from all this. Anyway, yeah. So I guess my question is that, given that, and given this dichotomy that you know I'm setting up here, how do you how do you determine risk, or how do you define risk? Because I think mm. most people that have had your experience. Are concerned about volatility and you mentioned that before so obviously that is a component of risk but mm -hmm. the way i think of it is that bitcoin is basically a hedge against everything else and everything else is a hedge against bitcoin because mm. i i only see those two paths forward either bitcoin yeah. trends towards zero forever or it trends towards infinity <laughs> yes in, in, in dollar terms forever and so mm -hmm. therefore Anything that's not Bitcoin that you buy is like a hedge against Bitcoin failing. And mm. every time you buy Bitcoin is a hedge against everything else falling in price. Sure. So that's how I would define it. And that's why I strongly encourage people to get off zero, get some amount. Because if you 
have these two points of risk and you're all on this one side 100%. You know, that, at least that's how I communicate to people. Yes. But from your perspective as a risk manager, as formerly having a fiduciary um, mm -hmm. duty to all these people, how would you define risk? If I were to come to you and say, what's the risks with Bitcoin? Is it high risk? Is it low risk? Should I buy bonds instead of Bitcoin because mm -hmm. it's low risk? Can they actually pay me a yield? You know, how, mm -hmm. how would you answer those kinds of questions? Well, it's it's definitely a question that you can spend a lot of time answering, that's for sure, and, and approaching it from different angles. Um, but I think where I would start with that is what I alluded to earlier is, you know, and I've been actually having some great conversations with clients. Uh, and and the, it's interesting because it's like uh, I'm the, I'm one of those guys, Luke, who I, I tend to think by speaking. So I haven't really, <laughs> haven't really thought out what I'm going to say to you today. But as I start talking, my thoughts start to, you know, sh change. And then I, I, oh, yeah, that's what I meant. I mean, one thing I've been saying with clients is you have to have convictions. You know, it really is so important to have a conviction on something. So let's take those two paths you just mentioned. And I agree, by the way. I think it's just that black and white. It's either going towards zero or it's going towards infinity. I don't think ultimately there's going to be a middle ground. I think it's going to be one or the other. Now, there may be other forms of store of value such as gold I, I think gold may still be used in certain situations okay fine uh, but the point is is that that that's really the the choices and so if that's true and you and I are right that really all things other than maybe time because other than Bitcoin I don't know of anything that's finite really I mean if you read uh, some some books on this other than time you know, if there's if something we need, human beings have a, a wonderful capacity for finding, you know, whatever it is that we, we want, whatever that we see as valuable. So I think that you have to have, uh, you have to have a conviction with whatever you're going to be investing in. Because if Bitcoin is going to succeed, the risk that you lose on this in Bitcoin terms, is pretty high if you and I are correct, because Bitcoin's only going to get more and more hard, more and more valuable over time as more and more people are clamoring for it, and there's only going to be 21 million of them. So, and, and again, it's hard to see this because we're not there yet, but I wonder if, you know, um, if everything's going to lose value in Bitcoin terms. I've thought about this too, again, not not too deep, but will that cause people to not do anything, you know, just sit in their store of value and to not actually, you know, use it as a medium of exchange or to use it to uh, invest in something? I don't think so. I think that people will part with Bitcoins, but again, based on convictions, they won't care perhaps so much about standard deviation or risk or whatever, because they believe in that something. You know, I'll give you an example. I, I donated 20,000 sats to Lightning Plus, Lightning Network Plus, because they really helped me to get my Lightning node started up. You know, I was able to get liquidity. And so I was grateful. But that 20,000 sats that I, quote, invested in or I donated, um, it's worth more now than when I gave it to them. I don't care because I had a conviction. I wanted to see that company do well. So. Again, don't know if I answered your question, but I, I don't know if we're going to be thinking about this the same way as time goes on. Yeah. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. And I, I think basically to I think basically to put that together, it just comes down to do you value something more than the Bitcoin? You know? And right now it's like you value or we value pretty much everything more than the dollar. And so mm -hmm. we buy pretty much everything other than the dollar and we hold and save yeah. our money in that. And mm -hmm. what happens when we actually value the money? Yeah, so. right. And it's, it's hard to imagine. It's kind of like the iPhone. I remember, I've, I don't know if this is true or if it's apocryphal, but, you know, when Steve Jobs was trying to come up with the iPhone, you know, people are like, hey, why don't you survey, you know, your people? And he's like, they don't know what they don't know. I'm not going to serve. I know what they need. Yeah. You know, and so it's like, you know, yeah, I, I don't, I just don't know that we can even imagine what, 
how this is going to change the world, but yeah, um, who knows? Yeah. yeah. So um, I'm just because I'm curious and I, I want to be bold and ask you a question. What, yeah. what do you think about bonds? Because for me, and I'm in a similar boat in that I think gold might have a place. I, I personally don't think it does because unlike Bitcoin, we're only going to be able to make more gold. Uh, you know, we've just last year found more gold in Uganda. I think just a few days ago, we found more gold in China. Mm. Um, and, you know, as we get better and better technology, we'll only have a greater and greater financial incentive to mine gold and sure. maybe create gold, you know. Well, so anyway, that, that's kind of my view, but I agree with you that it's probably better than many things. Mm -hmm. uh, real estate seems to me also uh, better than stocks or bonds. And it seems to me that stocks are better than bonds. And basically my thought process in all this is basically what has the most monetizable value or what, mm. what asset has the greatest percentage of its value that is being used as purely a savings mechanism. And the reality yes. is that as much as gold and real estate are monetized or fine art or whatever, it's like everyone, everyone buys stocks and bonds and nobody questions it just because mm -hmm. that's easiest. You, yeah. you can treat, you can treat a diversified stock portfolio like money because you, you know, like I said earlier, you can't treat cash like money. So the, mm -hmm. the stocks are easy because unlike real estate, it's very, it's very liquid more or less, you know, you, you don't have to wait and have all this difficulty with it. And same thing with gold. You don't have to exchange it and all that. So, so anyway, and, and there's a lot of research and studies into that too, of discussing how much of the value of all these things are monetized. But basically when I look at the world today, it seems to me that one of the most insane things are bonds. And especially now with all, everything with um, Silicon Valley Bank and, and these like, you know, it's just, obviously there's many factors that it's, it's too complicated for this, but basically mm -hmm. it's like, when I look, when I look at the world going into the future, it's like these bonds are debt of nations that we know are insolvent. We know they can't pay it back. Their interest expenses are way too high. It's like we basically have a system that's issuing pieces of paper that it has to pay interest on that can't pay for the interest unless it creates more pieces of paper. Mm -hmm. So when I look forward, it's like, it, it, to me, as I look at these bonds, it's like, we're only going to expand the supply of these bonds exponentially and simultaneously the demand will fall. And we have to keep yields low mm. because they can't go up <laughs> uh, <laughs> because you make the first two problems worse. And mm. so then fourth, that means that inflation has to be bad. And so mm -hmm. it's like this, you know, and it, I look at it today and I see all these problems. And I'm like, wow, that's really bad. And then I read history and that's when I get really concerned because it's like, Oh my goodness, this empire, this colony, or this, that, the other. It's like the same thing. You know, they basically the chickens have to come home to roost. Mm -hmm. And it to me, it seems inevitable that all of these bonds, all of this debt that's sitting in 401ks and pensions and you know, wherever is basically inevitable to just die. Either it has to default in real terms. Same mm -hmm. thing with social security, by the way. It either mm -hmm. has to default in real terms or the underlying unit of money has to default in nom or it has to default in nominal terms or it has to default in in real terms. So mm -hmm. that, that for me, that's one of the things that I've been trying to encourage people that you own debt of a nation that's broke. And so you mm -hmm. think that by investing in the centralized point, you're really investing in the whole broad economy. You know, when you're buying bonds, you're buying part of the American economy, the American taxpayer base. And you know, I don't think that's true because you're not really doing that. You're not really mm -hmm. investing in the taxpayer base. You're investing in the government's reputation, which mm -hmm. granted is solid, especially when compared to the other 140 nations of the world. Mm -hmm. But to me, it's like Bitcoin's even better because you're not just, you're, you're getting rid of the middleman. You're getting rid of the centralized point, number one. Number two, there's no counterparty risk. It's not debt. And number three, you're not getting just the United States. You're getting the whole world. And it doesn't yeah. matter what nation does well or what nations go to war. It's like your Bitcoin should be fine. Or, anyway, I'm again going out of rant, but <laughs> uh, anyway, it's like all that to say is like when I talk to people, that's the kind of thing that I try to explain that it's like what you're really doing with bonds is you're trying to diversify your risk as much as possible and mm -hmm. find a centralized entity that is the lowest risk. And mm -hmm. that's the United States 
and the United States government. And yeah. what if we were to find a way to negate the need for that centralized choke point entirely, and you have it more, even more diversified? And so, anyway, that's the kind of thing where it's like I beg people to like take five percent or one percent or ten percent or you know just I, I don't tell them a percent. I just say take some negligible percentage and mm -hmm. just just do it. Just buy it. Yeah. <laughs> but yeah. anyway, that that's my um. Little, I think you're little, right. I, you know, Greg Greg Foss has been one of my heroes in the Bitcoin okay. community, um, and of course, you know, he's been in the bond market um, now for I think I think his career spans over thirty years. Yeah, thirty five years. Uh, he, he was and, and second, he's yeah. mm -hmm. he's famous, you know, for saying that Bitcoin is the the greatest asymmetric bet. You know, I, I'm not exactly sure how long, but that you're ever going to see basically. Um, and and he makes the point, and people like Lynn Alden to make the point, and it, it this isn't complicated. Or or Lepard, you know, that, or Lepard, yeah, yeah, yeah. It's like okay, so your bond is paying you two percent, inflation's eight percent, your real return is negative six. That that is pretty easy, even for you know someone off the street to understand that you're actually losing money in that thing. So I think, you know, there's this wonderful uh, image on the internet of, you know, Bitcoin, this black hole that's just sucking the wealth out of the world, you know, and, and bonds, I think, are probably a prime candidate for being the leader on that. You know, as you, we've touched on real estate and other asset classes, um, but I think bonds are uh, a slam dunk. So I think that especially as it as the adoption curve, as, as we go along the adoption curve, institutional money is going to uh, see that the Fed is trapped. Um, and probably if history is any guide, they're going to, which way are they going to go? You know, are they going to deflate it or are they going to hyperinflate it to death? We think I, we know. Yeah. 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 Um, they'll, they'll just print more. And, and Foss says, you know, QE forever or, or QE unlimited or whatever, which is basically. Or, or, or Kaiser or. or um, yeah. There, Paul, there's, or, a, you know, there's dozens of people. There's a number of them. Yeah. yeah, I, yeah. I happen to watch Foss probably more than any other. But well, I, I like uh, that he I don't like he's not shy to go on a rant and curse people out and <laughs> tell us how he really feels. Yeah. 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 yeah so. OK, so so do you so like me, clearly, I think bonds are one of the largest targets for Bitcoin. And I think one of the first ones to go just because they're. Yeah, so that, I would that's say my so. Idea. Would you say the same thing or do you think? I would say so. Yes. Yeah. At least okay. currently. I mean, unless something changes. Yes. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. I have no bonds, nor have I had bonds for quite some time. Um, and of course, and, and anybody watching this who is you know, not really understanding bonds are debt. That's all they are. And as interest rates go up, bond prices go down because the bonds from, let's say, five yeah. years ago, you know, their interest rates much lower than what the same bonds would be today. And so I guess, you know, that was one of the things I did that was right is that I haven't had bonds uh, because I, I see it. I see that they're uh, you're right. People do it because that's what their financial advisor says. You got to diversify on equity and fixed income and a couple other asset classes. And and we're just kind of locked into that mindset. But mm -hmm. but they really don't make any sense. So. Yep, and and that's and that's my concern. That what if we're diversifying in a mixed basket of you know like um, inferior technologies, and mm. there's this new technology that makes all the other ones irrelevant. So yeah. So anyway, anyway, to speculate with you for for a moment, that this is one of my main concerns. I I'm concerned that in the next five years or so, and I know we're getting short of time because of our. Oh no no! I just I, yeah. I saw someone out my window. I'm oh, good. Oh You're okay good. okay yeah no I'm good. Um. Yeah, my, my question being that I think probably people are going to realize in the next few years that volatility is not the only risk, but there is also counterparty risk. And there's also technological risk, for lack of a better mm -hmm. term. There's a risk that you can become outdated. Yeah. And I, I think those are very significant risks. And I think those only become more apparent or higher risks in comparison to volatility as a function of society and technology becoming more volatile mm -hmm. um so so my my concern is that in the next few years the next five ten years or so we'll have nations pension funds institutions corporations millionaires billionaires we'll have all these large entities that begin realizing that there's an uncomfortable chance that what we're talking about right now could be right you know they, they don't yeah. have to believe 100 percent chance you're right but 
that, that's that's my worry. What if the United States government and China or Russia or a big pension fund or someone that owns a hundred million dollars or a hundred billion dollars of bonds or whatever mm -hmm. uh, wants a 1% allocation to Bitcoin or whatever, just, just in case. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and basically they, they shift the perception of risk. Their brain finally adapts away from volatile number is risk to mm -hmm. there are other kinds of risk. And so my question for you is, do you think there's a possibility that the very people that should be aware of this perhaps are the precise people that are falling behind because that's my, that's my personal concern that what yeah. the people that are the most trained in the current set of rules are the ones that are going to be the last to realize that there's a competing set of rules now and even if you don't think that other set of rules is inevitably going to win like we do it's like mm -hmm. there's a chance yeah so th that's my worry that in the next few years a few big players will figure out bitcoin and that for all the financial advisors of today and people today that have 60, 70, 80% of their retirement savings and bonds, mm -hmm. that they'll have to make a drastic decision really quickly into something they don't understand. Yeah. That's that's my worry. That in a few years, people will have to make severe life decisions uh, yeah. very quickly. So anyway, what, what do you yeah. think about that? You think that's fear mongering? Do you think that's legitimate? Why? And why no, think I, I think you're right on. In fact, you're probably understating uh, the problem. Um, you know, it, it it's a major problem. In fact, I, I think you've been in on the conversation on Twitter of late uh, related to Balaji's prediction that, you know, in, in the next 90 days, Bitcoin is going to a million. And many Bitcoiners have kind of pushed back on that to say, wait a minute, we kind of we don't want it to be that disorderly because yeah. the whole the whole world could collapse, which I think is a real risk. I, I don't happen to agree with that uh, forecast. But hey, if, he, if he's yeah. right and yeah, he has my respect. Um, but yeah, it's like um, uh, this, we want to have some time for the unwinding of the old regime, the old system. We don't want it to be a catastrophic end um, where people are suddenly being, you know, running around like chickens with their heads cut off, wondering, where do I place my capital if the capital even is still there? I mean, if you were a shareholder in Silicon Valley Bank, you know, a week and a half ago, you were wondering how that was going to all end up. You know, I mean, look how fast that happened on a weekend. And then two more banks. It was actually, I think, uh, is it Silvergate and then SVB and then Signature Bank? You know, it was just all these three uh, crypto banks. You know, basically. Um, so, so yeah, I would, I would like to, to see it to to see it be a little bit more orderly. But I think you're right. I think people are going to have to educate themselves quickly. The one thing I will say, though, Luke, is that I do think that we've had enough we've had enough warnings since 2008 where even, you know, if you go to Walmart and you interviewed 100 people there, even though they might not be able to articulate it in a certain way, they sense something. You know, I think people are sensing upheaval. Um, the fourth turning, you know, you've probably heard of that, that book's been, uh, you know, and we're right there in that fourth turning where something, some major shakeup is happening and people can't quite put their finger on it. But, you know, so, so even though they might not know of these risks, they don't know what they don't know. I think they at least know on some level that something's changing and they, they're, they might have to, um, you know, um, forge new paths. So. Yeah, and I think that goes a lot back to what Jeff Bu talks about with misinformation, that I think the rise of conspiracy theories and apocalyptic scenarios and, you know, all, all these um, things that are just bubbling up in the last decade or so, I, I think a lot of that is coming from the, this existential feeling that everyone feels like the world is ending. And the way I put it to people is that the world is not necessarily ending, but perhaps a technological paradigm as well as a rules-based system on top of that paradigm what if those are both ending and it seems to yeah. me that many technologies are at risk of that and it seems to me bonds are at risk of both bonds yes. are an inferior technology and they're part of a uh, basic yeah. rules that might go away so yeah and i'm not against debt i mean um, yeah, I think yeah. it's time and a place to borrow but uh, when you have bad money it, it incentivizes bad debts you know yeah. basically borrowing for everything well um, and, and, because... and borrowing dollars into existence that that's something else a lot of people realize too right right yeah yeah, yeah exactly so. so so it's that we have 
we have an excess of bonds. We have it's you know maybe in a, in a future world where you know we have an end but a beginning. You know we rise from the ashes. Let's say um, you know I think that there will still be debt. I think there will still be banks. Um, but again, it's like that bank are they going to part with their bitcoins for anything? No, yeah. they're going to make sure that yeah. uh, the, in other words, underwriting is going to going to come back into yeah. uh, the conversation. So. Yeah, exactly. You know, that, that's one of the things that the Krugman types of the world, um, you know, say Bitcoin's bad because deflation, this, that, the other. And, you know, it's likewise, it's like, well, what if, you know, it's much harder to borrow money or create credit in the future world, but everything's 50 times cheaper. You know, it's like, yeah. well, no one will be able to get a mortgage on their house if you have a deflationary money. It's like, well, uh -huh. what if the house is getting cheaper? <laughs> it's exactly. like, it's incentivized. It, it, Instead of a world where it disincentivizes saving and incentivizes credit, where then you know you can get yield, yeah. there's no need for credit because the prices keep going down. So, anyway, it's fascinating. We can keep going on and on, but I have one yeah, last question. I really want to sure. ask you, yeah. And, and then maybe we'll have to do another call in the future sometime. But my question is, um, a lot of people, probably financial advisors, and uh, you know, some of them might fully agree with what we're saying right now, others wouldn't. But to me, I think it's reasonable to expect that the majority of financial advisors don't understand what we're talking about right now. And I think it's even reasonable that they have differing opinions. But the thing that drives me nuts personally is when finance professionals, hedge funds managers, people that go on TV say things that are just so absurdly <laughs> factually wrong. Yeah. <laughs> they, that, that they, they, they just say things that frankly to me are like mind boggling. Uh, like just in factual inaccuracies and and then like whenever i hear that for me i just tune them out completely because it's like like no like way. buying bitcoin at 500 dollars an ounce <laughs> <laughs> yeah 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 um, yeah something like that uh, so <laughs> my question to you is if somebody's watching this and they have questions and they're not really sure what to think and they want to take time to think about this what are the two or three questions you think they should ask their financial advisor about bitcoin to gauge whether their financial advisor has even taken the time to learn about Bitcoin, because I, yeah. I generally think the vast majority of finance professionals haven't taken the time and they just say something. What one of those mm -hmm. cliches, like we were talking about earlier, oh, it uses too much energy. Oh, nobody uses. Oh, there's no adoption. Oh, they're going to ban it. Or, oh, you know, bonds yeah. have a longer track record or gold is a longer track record. You know, mm. I, I think people tend to default to that. So, what are the couple questions you think, from you being in that chair, that you think every financial advisor, without excuse, should be able to answer? Um, yeah. That you think maybe should be insightful for people as they th take away from this discussion thinking about it yeah good well, that's a great question right there um and a good one to end on so i i think um and i haven't had i didn't think about this but i'll, I'll try to come up with a couple uh so the first one i would say is what you just said is have you personally mr financial advisor taken the time to learn about it because there's a lot there's there's a lot to learn here you know, um, so have you personally taken the time to learn about it? Because you don't have an excuse now. You know, there, it's been around for 15 years. You know, even if your firm or you are not going to be recommended, you need to have a good reason for whether you are or not. So have you personally taken the time? And if I were being asked that question, I would say yes. Um, and then so and then the second question would be, if you are not, if you're against it, after having uh, educated yourself, why what do you not like about it um and then uh and then what do you like if i by the way i don't know about you luke but anybody i know and and i you know probably in, in the couple of dozen range um who has gone down the bitcoin rabbit hole has not come out like yeah that's nothing nobody you know so um unless it's just someone who already has decided beforehand that I, I, I i'm the same way i have not met a single person and this is why I asked this question. I've not met a single person that can tell me the technically factual components of Bitcoin that has undone becoming a Bitcoiner or unconverted, right. so to speak. Yeah. And the terrifying thing is to me, I every person I talk to, like you, says the exact same thing. That yeah. either they have no technical understanding of Bitcoin and they don't like it, or they have a technical understanding of facts And they like it. And yes. they like it. So anyway, exactly. sorry. Yeah, because it's what's not to like. I mean, it's perfect money, right? <laughs> Um, so those two questions, it would be, you know, uh, have you have you taken the time to understand it? Um, number two is, 
um, what do you or do you not like about it? And I would like to hear a balanced approach. There's some things about Bitcoin that I'm concerned about, let's say, but you know they, they pale in comparison to what I like about it. Um, and then the third thing I would say is, if you liked it, are you freely able to help me get some? You know, because the way it's set up, oftentimes it's like, even if I liked it, we'd have to go out into a dark room in a quiet place where I could tell you how I really feel because my firm won't let me actually. It doesn't, in other words, are you make? is there a way for you to advise me and still be compensated for your services? Are, are you allowed to like it? Yeah, allowed to, are you, you know, because that's a big problem, by the way, and I, I won't go too far down this path, but there's a big problem is the way that financial advisors are paid. I think hourly is the most honest now, um, but it's also the most difficult. You know, you wake up every day unemployed until someone says, I'm, I want to take an hour of your time. Whereas if you have assets under management, oh, I manage a hundred million. So my fees are a million. You wake up every day and you're making a million bucks a year, you know, just because you're the manager of the investment portfolio. So it's difficult to have a compensation structure that is truly in the customer's best interest. You know, back in the day, it was brokerage commissions. Okay, so that was pretty bad. Assets under management, maybe an improvement, but I really think that we should be billing uh, based on our time with hopefully no, uh, uh, nothing that impinges our ability to give the full truth, to say how we really feel. And then the customer can then go execute it. You know, I'm not being paid because they did something, you know, at my brokerage institution. So that'd be the third thing is if you did like it, can you help me to get it, you know, or are you? prevented from that so yeah yeah i think those are great thoughts do, do you have a fourth one or are those your big three <laughs> um i think those are the big three yeah yeah yeah, yeah I, I think i think i would add to that and maybe uh you would agree yeah with please I, Go I, ahead. I i i think i think i should add to that do they understand custodial versus non-custodial um Bitcoin? oh that's a good one yeah do great. they understand proof of stake versus proof of work do they understand the difficulty adjustment? Do they understand the block reward? Do they? Mm -hmm. you know, th th I think those are some big ones, and I think yes. the vast majority don't understand that because it's like if you don't understand those things I just mentioned, it's like you don't know what you're talking about, pro yeah. or against. It's like yeah. you don't even understand the points of the argument to be pro or con against. So yes. Anyway, very yeah, that was kind of in my first question: is have you taken yeah. the time to understand it? If you yeah. if you if you've taken the time to understand it, I can quiz you on those things you just named. And you're going to be able to tell me real quickly if you actually have or not. Yeah. Uh, but you're right. Those 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 details are, are essential. I think custody versus non-custody is uh, custody is a is a huge one. I I personally am a big advocate for taking possession of your wealth yeah. um, and custody. So. Well, thank you very much. I appreciate yeah. your time. Appreciate your discussion.